It's been my mission to turn cunt into a positive word because it's so often used negatively. But um, usually as an adjective, like that cheesecake was cunt. And I actually started a little hashtag, uh, totes cunt, when something's really good. I love a cunt. Who doesn't love a cunt? Can you talk about um, what your style says about you? That I'm a butch dyke. My entire life has been trying to put a positive spin on what it is to be butch. Media has always portrayed us as, as fat and stupid, and uh, we beat our wives, we cause fights, at, at, you know, we drive trucks. And part of being butch is the dress, is the look. People had to recognize what you were the second you walked in that bar. In those days, it was very important. <laughs> this would have been, uh, for me, in the early 70s. I went into, uh, believe it or not, it was called the Red Bulls. I had a fake ID, I was 16 years old. Some big old monster dagger butch sitting at the bar. Turned around and went, hey, baby butch! <laughs> at me. And I was like, what? Come here! <laughs> So I went over to her and uh, she kind of, Al was her name, and she sort of raised me. Butches do everything. We cook, we clean, we, uh, we, we, we have to be really good at everything. That's our thing. And of course, you have to take care of your lady, your femme. You have to be very attentive, open doors. I mean, I've always considered myself a feminist. And when I open a door for a woman, I'm not implying that she's weak anyway. To me, it's a, it's a matter of politeness and respect. But with a man, I do it. I opened the door. I started doing stand-up comedy uh, in 1982, you know, performing as the fucking dyke in San Francisco. I've always been moderately famous. I used to say, for me, it's been a long climb to the middle until I did the Arsenio Hall show in 1993 and was the first openly gay comic on television. Now, before that, Nellie Fags and Butch Dykes are very much looked down on and treated as second-class citizens. I was a carpenter at the time. I was working an all-gay construction crew in San Francisco. We renovated houses, and I really would enjoy going into a dyke bar with my tool belt on after work, covered in dirt, thinking I was God's gift to women. And that's when eventually some girl would come up to me and say something. First, they take a wide berth because they're afraid that I'm going to hit them or something. Oh, what? Oh, you're what? What's that? A martini? Why you're not drinking a beer? Stand-up comedy in those days was a big activist tool. So that's what I started doing. I'm very grateful for that because I probably would have, you know, put a gun in my mouth mm -hmm. if I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Especially after 12, 12 years of Catholic school, it's like everything's my fault. Can you talk about um, your, the biggest struggle that you've had? I think personally, uh, my coming out experience was very, very difficult. I mean, because I thought I was the only one. And that was before you know, modern family, will and grace. When I finally did get my fake ID and go to that gay bar, I mean, that was a struggle. It was a really difficult thing for me to accept that I, I was this person. Going into that bar, that was without a doubt probably my most difficult struggle. And then coming out to my family. The standard Catholic thing um, the entire basis of that religion is if you ignore it, it will go away. I hated myself for not being normal. Yeah. At that time, still considered a mental disease. Mm. I ate a lot as a, a comfort situation. When you're queer, there's this thing inside your head that when you get home, like at the end of your day, and you walk into your apartment and you close the door, and it's, it's weird, but it's true, there's a part of you that goes, phew, made it. Right. Made it, nobody beat me up, nobody called me a dyke on the street, nobody, you know, today was a good day. When I was a teenager, that was exacerbated. That was like, because I was cowering in the closet, terrified that somebody would know my dirty little secret. When I went into that bar, it was that feeling, again, that made it, nobody called me a dyke. It was like walking in and I'm like, wow, I'm home. So when I was 28 was when I finally told my mom and dad. Yeah. What did they know? I was an openly gay stand-up comic for years before I finally told my family that I was gay. My siblings all knew, but I, I could not tell my mom and dad. I was completely convinced that I could not tell my mom and dad. Wow. My father had no idea. Like, none. And let me just say to that, what do they think look at me. What do they think look at me. They did ultimately accept me. And I'll tell you what helped that along. Um, when I got on Matlock, 
something about being on television with Andy Griffith. I, oh, there was something about that really turned a, a lot of ideas around for them. I think that they were able to see that other people could, uh, other people could deal with it. Look, I am a proud fat woman, period. We live in a fattest society that expects, especially of women, certain things, uh, especially around their weight, and it's bullshit. I always say, I read fat as a feminist issue. Halfway through, I got bored and ate it. I think because I'm the world I live in, the actor world that I live in, um, the entertainment world I live in, because also when I sing or when I do stand-up, it's the same thing. Um, women, it's, it freaks me out when they like when I'm standing next to a woman who is maybe a hundred pounds soaking wet talking about how fat she is. Think about it in the extreme in the extremities of anorexia. But I, I fucking live with it every day. The things that comes out of these the worst. men can weigh any fucking weight they want. They can be any weight they want. No one gives them shit about it. Look, obesity is an issue. I get it. It's a problem. It causes a, it causes a lot of a lot of things that people need to be aware of, right? But the flip coin of that is it's mostly genetics and there's, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's that simple. Nothing wrong. There's, fat is not ugly. Yeah. In fact, it's quite uh -huh. beautiful. Can you talk about um, what you feel has been your biggest accomplishment? Getting to the level that I've gotten to in this industry without ever having once been in the closet. I felt very deeply each insult that would happen to me every time somebody called me a dyke on the street, and, you know, all of that when I was younger. And I remember wanting to change things so that didn't happen. I've been queer bashed. I've been, I was beaten up horribly uh, in 1980 um, by a guy during, it was Gay Pride Week in San Francisco. Obviously, you know, somebody who'd come into the city looking for someone to beat up and I was the lucky lucky person. I wanted to make a change. I wanted to affect a change. And my best tool for that was my humor. Although we're not hearing a lot of it today. <laughs> yeah. It's mostly very serious stuff in here today. I was in the hospital for three days, uh, nose broken, ribs cracked, uh, you know, chipped eye socket. Um, he had a ring, a big ring on. So I have a scar on my nose from that. The worst of it was that people watched it happen and, and did nothing to intercede. The worst. Yeah, there was like 30 people that did nothing. I can't blame them that much. They were afraid. They were also gay. Do you know what I mean? They, it never occurred to them that all 30 of us could stop this guy. When do you feel the most vulnerable? It's not something I feel very often. I know that sounds weird and probably the most vulnerable I feel is when I'm shooting a uh, an important dramatic moment. Accessing weird emotions uh, within yourself is part of what I do. And I have to say, it's become a lot easier since of menopause. My emotions are right there now mm -hmm. in a way they never used to be, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm also let, let go of the idea that I have to control them. They're just emotions, you know? They're not gonna grow up and have a life of their own. They're not gonna go to college. They're not gonna call you in the middle of dinner and try to sell you some fucking insurance or something. You know, it's, it's an emotion. Just feel, my, feel your emotions. And it's taken me a long time to get to that. Because again, emotions are something that I just sh shove it down, don't feel it. And trying to put up this big, strong face on everything. The stuff that you get, whether it's in the media or whatever that you get about it, it's all very male oriented. It's all about how it's gonna affect them as a man. But not a lot of shit that we need to hear. Like, I didn't know you were gonna lose your memory. Nobody told me that. Oh, and you'll get it back. By the way, when it's all over, your memory comes back. Honestly, I found myself staring at a picture of Robert De Niro once for like a half an hour before I could remember his fucking name was Robert De Niro. It's ridiculous. I talk about the itch, because that's lovely. You know, I just talk about all the stuff that they never, ever fucking tell you about. Yes. When do you feel the most beautiful? I never think of myself as beautiful. So that's a very strange word to apply to me, I think. I'm more of a handsome person. When I see, when my fiance looks at me with this look in her eye and I can see that she's completely and utterly in love with me, it makes me feel really handsome. Even when she's mad, I can still see it in her eyes. That makes me feel really, really beautiful. Almost beautiful, almost beautiful. I, I was so emotional at the SAG Awards and uh, very openly emotional. Um, 
Well, it started with Uzo when Uzo won the SAG Award, right? Personally, her SAG Award. I've known Uzo for many years. We've done several shows together, and I knew that Uzo was quitting. Uzo was quitting show business. She was going to be a lawyer or something. You know, everybody goes through dry spells as an actor. Don't do it. You're too talented. But she was convinced. She was literally leaving on Monday. And on Friday, she got the call that she was cast as Crazy Eyes in Orange is the New Black. And she, she won, and I don't know what it was. I just started crying. And it, just from there, that right after Uzo won, the cast won. And uh, there was, to have grown up the way I've grown up, to be 56 years old, I was at the time, to have never been in a closet, to, uh, you know, gone through all the career things that I've gone through, this sort of recognition, especially by my peers, and then the world, I mean, it's just not supposed to happen for you. This is not supposed to happen. And I found myself getting very emotional about it, you know, that at this point in my life, this sort of recognition. I was just very, very emotional. Okay, so last question. Why um, in your body is it a good place to be? Because I love me. What's not, look at this. What's not to love? <laughs> I, agree. I agree. Perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, no. Thank you for having me. That was amazing. Awesome. So I'm going to take photos of you now. Yes. And then when you're dressed. Yes. I, and as you're going to dress, and then Andrea just needs you to take everything off one more time. It'll take five minutes. Okay. For the B-roll. Okay. <laughs> that was great.